who is uh, the who is professor of ethical leadership at the Stern Putatively. School of Business at New York University. And he's a, a very prolific author and uh, widely known one of the most influential social political psychologists around today. Author of let me see if I get this: The Righteous Mind. Uh, author also of. Uh, the coddling of the American mind with Greg Lukianoff uh, and uh, a principal in the founding of Heterodox Academy, which is a, a group of reflective and concerned uh, academics who are promoting the uh, diversity of thought within the American university institutional complex. And uh, John is also the, also the author of an article recently published in the Atlantic magazine called Why Have the Last 10 Years of American Life Been Uniquely Stupid? wherein uh, he finds the answer to be somehow social media, and that's a tale within itself. So we're talking with John about uh, American intellectual life at this, uh, at this date uh, in our politics, uh, in our culture, uh, and in our institutions. So welcome, John. Thank you, Glenn. What a pleasure to be talking with you. Yeah, we've been circling around each other for mm -hmm. a long time. I ran into you at a seminar that you did at John Tomasi's invitation up here at Brown a couple of years ago, and, and we exchanged some words very briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. am uh, going to participate in Heterodox's uh, uh, annual uh, confab in Denver with uh, John McWhorter in uh, a keynote conversation that's being uh, staged by that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's good to be talking with you. Yeah, great to be talking to you. Now, you might not remember, but I actually invite our first contact was I was involved in putting together a group of policy experts left and right uh, under AEI and Brookings. And I invited you, and you, you said you were going to come to one of our meetings, but you just got overwhelmed. You couldn't make it. Um, so that was our first meeting was you blew me off. But then I met you at Brown, and then you asked me a very good, hard question. You were the only one who asked me a hard question. I don't remember what it was, but I remember I was expecting a softball from you because you're one of the first members of Heterox Academy. You know, you and I, I assume, you know, because I, I gave a talk at Brown on how the social sciences are getting damaged by, by the, these political forces. And then you were kind of skeptical. It was actually great. It was like, yeah, this is what academic life is supposed to be like. I remember my question, John. You want to oh, hear it? Again? Yes. Let me see if I can answer it better this time. What was it? Okay. Well, so I thought the concern about uh, the lack of hetero, uh, heterodox thinking within the university was correct, uh, but was focused on process without okay. addressing itself to the substantive issues at stake between left and right, I, I say just to put it very simply, yeah. uh, uh, over questions of, uh, of value, which uh, needed to be debated and on which it was entirely appropriate to take a side. And it seemed you were bending over backwards to avoid, especially in the most you know, to my mind, uh, egregious errors of the consensus view. So we have a consensus view. It's bad that the consensus view doesn't allow in any alternative view. That's bad. Mm -hmm. But to the extent that the convinced consensus view is just wrong, it's an error, that needed to be addressed as well. Uh, and uh, it seemed that you were avoiding, I thought, mm -hmm. or wanted to suggest the possibility that uh, you might be av avoiding the fisticuffs necessary to actually correct error. Ah, okay. Okay. So if I seem to be avoiding, it's because that is actually a hard question, and I almost never get hard questions. Uh, in fact, what I can say is from the time I sort of stepped out and, and wrote the Coddling the American Mind article with Greg Lukianoff in 2015, um, nobody really argued back against us. People called us all kinds of names. There were two bad reviews in which they said we're associated with white supremacy, we're associated with Jordan Peterson, we're associated with this and that. But uh, it, most of my career, I was used to getting questions like the one you asked from philosophers, from sociologists, from people in different, you got to really like think hard, like, wait, I don't know, I don't have an easy answer to that question. Um, and I guess maybe it sort of threw me because I almost never get hard questions anymore. And uh, I suppose you and I could go at it. I'm going to sort of dodge it now, because if you and I were to get into it now, that would bore our listeners terribly. No, I, I agree let's, with let's that. We we'll circle back to it. Because we had another agenda. But somehow okay. I feel like I've just had a move made on me in which my frontal assault got deflected <laughs> into a self-deprecatory, yep, yep. what a good question, whatever, whatever, mm -hmm. which only shows you in a very positive light. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I did. You're exactly right. <laughs> okay. 
So I'm not going to give a long preamble here. Uh, this is my view about the stupidity problem, the, the Babel problem uh, that you uh, delineate in your Atlantic article. Uh, I think the world has gone mad. I mean, I think so. Uh, I mean, but it's across issues on which there is very sharp division. And so I'm reluctant to take a take a position, even though I have a position. But I, I, I think the Black Lives Matter riots of 2020, or I should say the George Floyd protest, you know, I should say that. The way in which we process the racial reckoning. I mean, I could give many examples. My university president, the very respected economist and administrator, academic administrator, uh, Professor Dr. Christina Paxson, wrote a letter to colleagues, and many institutions did it. Mm -hmm. Hers is not the only letter. It's not the worst letter, et cetera, et cetera. The letter took a position in a political dispute. On, with yep. the way the wind was blowing, it took this kind of stance. It was we performative. Are to the, I, I think she says something about social justice as a bedrock value. Is that the letter? Uh, well, I, I don't remember that phrase, but it well may have been because I don't know that there were many letters. And it was a, immediately in the aftermath of the, of the uh, George Floyd event. And, and she was uh, communicating uh, to the community, including alumni and uh, uh, students and so on, the, the, the position of the university. And I don't want to I don't want to get us down the rabbit hole of this of this particular <laughs> letter. I simply wanted to give my example of a sense of distress at the world gone mad uh, because fads sweep among us uh -huh. uh, and, and dominate uh, the performative uh, actions of responsible people who should be standing for a set of principles. Now I'm back to the dispute that yeah. I was trying to outline yeah. between you because I think that standing for the principles is most important. Yep. The discussion of police killings, I think, um, uh, fiasco of public policy decision-making, again, in my view. Oh, yeah. It was that so much as to say, I, I, I was just dismayed at the yes. way that decisions were being made and the way that the rational exactly. weighing of the various values just couldn't take place. And, and the, the amount way of, that decisions were being made, that's the key, right? And, and the amount of finger pointing and name calling and, 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 and whatnot, and the amount of virtue signaling and mm -hmm. identity, you know, a, enacting of uh, one's mm -hmm. identitarian impulses through the... Uh, political expression and the way in which institutions um, uh, did, 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 not, did not function entirely properly, our political institutions, our intellectual uh, institutions, and so forth. So, uh, you know, yeah. I've been okay. dismayed. Am I okay. dismayed about January 6th? Yes, I'm dismayed mm -hmm. about January 6th. Yeah. There was just a horrible <clears throat> shooting in Buffalo, New York. Am I Dismayed about violence, yep. political violence, racist political violence. Yes, I'm dismayed about these things. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't just uh, pile up on the on the cultural left, but but uh, so you know. Okay, so can I have a theory such as you have? I had the sense that we're losing our minds. Okay, so all right, so that's the way it feels. I have that feeling too. But one thing I've learned, uh, so I've been sort of in this business, as it were, since about 2014, 2015, when I wrote the College of American Mind. And, you know, you and I both work on college campuses. We talk with a lot of students. What percentage of your students would you say have lost their minds? Ballpark figure. What yeah, this is at Brown, and Brown is a liberal place. I'd say a quarter, max. Okay. Yeah, max. I'd say, yeah. Okay, and I'd say it's substantially less than that. What percent of your colleagues or what percent of the other professors at Brown, which they have lost their minds? They are, they are like insane, non-functional. Non no, I don't think they're insane. I, I think very few of them are insane, yeah. if any. Yeah, so this is my point, that what I found over and over again is that most people, the great majority of people are actually pretty reasonable. Um, I was engaged in a long debate um, uh, with a variety of other people or skeptics that anything's going on on campus, and they kept saying, yeah, but look, survey evidence shows that there's been not much change in what students believe, and most students still want to see viewpoint diversity. Most students still want to see, you know, they, they want to be exposed to ideas. So there's no problem. There's been no change. And my argument from the beginning has been, it's not that people have lost their minds. It's that the dynamics, the social dynamics changed in 2015 on campus, and then 2018 or so in, in many other places. The social dynamics changed so that sane people are now contributing to insane outcomes from groups and institutions. That's what my article was about. So it, the title, you know, so my, the title I gave The Atlantic was uh, uh, After Babel, uh, you know, how social media made America stupid, something like that. Um, yeah. 
And the point was not that people are stupid. It's that, that social media has, has created structural stupidity. So let me just briefly explain that for, li- for listeners. So the idea is um, uh, we are all flawed. We are all post hoc reasoners. My, my early research in moral judgment was about how our gut feelings drive our reasoning. I'm a devotee of David Hume. Reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can pretend to no other office than to serve and obey them. So that's the basic psychology is that we, our reasoning is driven by our passions. The great solution that, that liberal institutions found over the centuries is to, if you put people together in the right way, then their confirmation biases cancel out. So that's why the English system developed juries rather than the French system, which you have one investigator who's a genius and he gets to the truth. Like, no, that doesn't work. But if you have a jury with diversity on it, then from what I hear from lawyers, they actually, juries do a good job. Um, And if you have a university or a department or an academic field where you have some viewpoint diversity and you are in the only field I know of that has some, economics is only four or five to one left to right. My field is 20 or 30 to one left to right. So if you have some people who are going to say, like, no, that's bullshit, and here's why, like, then you can find the truth. So what happened with, so why am I blaming this on social media? Um, my explanation is polarization has been rising since the 90s. There's evidence about affective polarization begins rising in the 90s, especially. That has nothing to do with social media. It does have something to do with cable TV. So it's not all due to social media. So if we just look at how much left and right hate each other. That's been increasing for a while, has a lot of causes. But something changed in the early 2010s, in which we got afraid of each other. And cable TV didn't make us afraid of our students. And the, you know, the loss of a common enemy, the Soviet Union, is another factor that for polarization. It didn't make us afraid of our students. Um, the editors of the New York Times made mistake after mistake because they were afraid of their young staff members. They were afraid of Twitter. Um, it's this introduction of fear that has made institutions go stupid because when you have an institution predicated on on conflict, on debate, on challenge, and then you say, you know what, this side, shut up. If you say anything, you're dead. We're going to destroy you. Uh, and of course, you know, I saw the wonderful documentary that, you know, on, on Roland Fryer that you were involved in. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, even just for, you know, tweeting, even just for praising Roland Fryer, you're taking your career in your hands. That's insanity. So my argument is social media, when it started, was not particularly toxic. You put up pictures of, you know, your kids, you link to other people's pages, not toxic at all. It's only after it becomes about the news feed, and then you like things or not, and then you retweet or share. Everything is about virality. Um, what essentially happened was social media, especially Twitter is the worst at this. It was like passing out little dart guns. Everybody got a dart gun. And they could shoot anyone they wanted. They could, they could, you know, uh, a slur or attack or uh, uh, insult anybody they wanted for free, anonymously. Um, and what happens, you know, when that happens, people get scared, especially people who are moderates or dissenters, and also people who are leading. Leaders basically caved almost instantly. You know, all the student had to do was lodge a complaint, and the leader's going to bow down and say, "Okay, yeah, tell me what to do. I don't just stop shooting. Stop shooting." So let me stop you there because I want to try to understand this thing about leadership. I I was composing in my mind a response to your uh, long and enlightening statement, and it was turning on courage as the uh, necessary counterpoint to fear, and on leadership as the instrumentality through which courage would express itself. So help me understand how leadership has been impaired mm-hmm. uh, in this environment of social media and and partisanship. Yeah. So we could, um, we could study the situation from a point of view of personality uh, and individual action and leadership, and we would find that almost all university presidents were incredibly lacking. They were cowards. Many of them were just cowards. And there's only two or three I can point to that were brave. You know, and Robert Zimmer at Chicago is certainly you know, the best known example. Uh, but you know, Peter Salovey at Yale just you know, instantly validated the protesters' narrative. Everything you say is true. Uh, And Yale to this day, since Peter Salovey validated the narrative, Yale to this day is one of the schools that keeps on giving us these absurd, absurd scandals, you know, heckler's veto, students shouting down speakers. That still happens at Yale Law School. Um, So so we can certainly say, yes, Peter Salovey was a coward. Um, We can say that almost all of them are cowards. But here's where I become a social psychologist. And I say, you know, if everybody is a coward, it's probably not because of a personal failing. It's probably because the situation is something that we can't understand from the outside. And that's what I'm trying to do. 
Um, I am personally mad at Peter Salvey because I went to Yale. I love Yale. And Yale really has been a leader um, in sort of the decline of universities into a more of activist political uh, uh, posture rather than a research posture. Um, but I have to understand that he and all the other presidents in 2015, were they, they were in a situation they had no idea what was going on. And the fact that they all folded and said the same sorts of thing, and they promised to do the work, and here's more money, and the fact that the same thing happened in corporate America and in newspapers, that means there's a social disease that we don't understand from the outside. And I believe the social disease is um, students... Uh, uh, mem- you know, young people who are politically active are very good on social media. They know just how to use these uh, use these things to apply pressure, to threaten reputation, to destroy reputation. So everyone gives in quickly. Well, uh, I'm I'm impressed by those observations. I I, I certainly uh, endorse the idea that if you're seeing behavior very widespread, the idea that it's rooted in personal uh, character. Uh, traits is is not a plausible hypothesis. Uh, something systemic must be going on. It doesn't follow from that that courageous acts of uh, heroism and courage couldn't be disruptive in a way to yes. so as to restore. You're right. I mean, I'm I'm reminded of this uh, old argument. I'm sure you're familiar with Elizabeth Neuler Neumann, the political scientist. I love that essay. I just Germany. read it a few months ago. Yes, the spiral of silence. You know, brilliant. Uh, where everybody keeps quiet because they don't know that they're opinion, which they held as, held by many others as well, but because the others are not speaking, they don't know it, and they stay quiet as well. And of course, that situation is rife for uh, uh, radical uh, disruption uh, in the sense that it can unravel. And once a few people start expressing an idea that is being suppressed by others because they think no one else holds it, it, it can it can sweep into sweep into play. But so but can you address my question about, you say uh, the president of Yale is a coward and the institution, are there no, um, you said uh, Robert Zimmer at the University of Chicago and he, and he stands out. Where are the alumni? Where are the, the donors? Uh, the various other stakeholders, uh, you know, that are at play. And isn't there a political corrective bound to come into action if you don't get leadership, that is demagogues, demagogues on the right, people like Donald Trump can rise to tremendous power just by tapping into the sense that, uh, you know, uh, institutions are failing us and, and the loss of trust that people have b- because everyone is fearful uh, about uh, saying the emperor has no clothes. Yeah, that's right. So, yes, we should be on the lookout uh, um, for backfire effects and for Pyrrhic victories. So a Pyrrhic victory, of course, is one where you win the battle, but the cost is so devastating that you end up losing the war. And the analysis I offer in, the, in my essay is, let's look at each side separately and let's see what's happening. Um, so let's start with the right. On the right, um, the Republican Party, I believe, has become structurally stupid. It is the insane party, much more so than the Democrats. What I mean by that, forget about policy issues. People can be upset about policy issues. Yeah. On which side, as long as you have a debate where you can take a moderate position, you can take a more far right position, do you have a debate between those? And on the Republican side, the answer is no. If you're a moderate, you're gone. You're already gone. There are no moderates left. So the Republicans shot their moderates. And if you shoot your moderates, then you become structurally stupid by definition. And, and then he loses and he does these things and the Congress covers for him. So the Republican Party is the structurally stupid party. And if we had a true market uh, if we had an effective, mar- structurally stupid, you may disagree with the things they say, but they've got moderates, they've got extremists, you know, Joe Manchin can hold everything up. So there is at least, there is debate within the party. The problem on the left, I believe, is, in, is that the left dominates the, almost all of the institutions, almost all of our epistemic and cultural institutions. Epistemic means those that generate knowledge. So journalism, the media, universities, the arts, all of these things have leaned left for a long, long time, which is not necessarily a problem. But what we documented at Heterox Academy is that beginning in the 90s, that left hand, that left lean, it used to be two or three to one left to right in this country, professors, it, it moved from two or three to one to five or six to one over about 15 years. By 2011, it was five or six to one. And, and that includes like the agriculture school and the engineering school. If you look at the central academic departments like psychology or economics, there, it's more like 10 or 20 to 1. 
So you lose your viewpoint diversity, um, and then this culture war comes in, and then this woke ideology comes in, which I'm now learning. I think um, what I'm learning is that it actually was, a part of it was nurtured on Tumblr. There were certain ideas that young women were getting on Tumblr around 2012, 2013, um, about microaggressions and, and, and safe spaces and trigger warnings. Um, and so this stuff comes into the university uh, around 2013, 2014. My point is just that on the left, it's not that the Democratic Party is stupid, it's that morally homogeneous or politically homogeneous organizations were ripe for the Noel Neumann spiral of silence, where if you're center left, as I always used to be, if you're center left, suddenly you're now, you know, right adjacent is what I've been called. You're right adjacent. And so, you know, if all the moderates get shot and silenced and shamed, then before you know it, the consensus is so far left that you get them doing stupid, stupid things. Policies that are so easy for Fox News to make fun of. And this is the okay, let, let, me, let me push back a minute. Let me push back a minute. Just, just this is just uh, devil's advocate or something like that. I, I don't doubt that the, there are problems in the Republican Party of the sort that you described, and Donald Trump's influence is clearly a part of the problem. But given a choice between capitalism, that is markets, that is private property and the rule of law, that, that is uh, a relatively free economy with a relatively small central government, necessary services being provided to people, but the greatest scope possible being given to initiative, liberty, and whatnot. Yep, that's, yeah, and, I, and what AOC, I'm sorry, just to be concrete, I don't mean any disrespect. You know what I'm trying to say. Would impose on us, okay, it's very clear in my mind. I'm not asking you to be a Republican. I'm declaring my own view and saying that it's not crazy. It's not crazy. It's not crazy to resist the avant-garde cultural revolutionists who are redefining ways of life amongst American people along norms that have not been vetted by any democratic process but rather are being imposed upon us by a sanctimonious and self-righteous elite. Okay? I could give concrete examples, but you see the general thing that I'm talking about. It is not crazy to want a border on the country, to be concerned about the indiscriminate and unregulated entry into the country of people without authorization. That's a real issue, John. It's not crazy. Now, the party that embodies defense of capitalism, the party that gives voice to the concerns of tens of millions of Americans about cultural revolution, the party that asks the question, can we have control over who enters our country, is the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Now, you cannot, I'm sorry about Donald Trump, I, I, I regret I understand and I agree with you about the primary structure and whatnot, but you can't refute the, the questions. Are we going to have a border on the country? Yeah. Okay. okay. Who's in control okay. of the culture? Mm -hmm. And how do you run the political economy? You can't refute that okay. uh, with a social psychological process that labels people as crazy. Okay. So, so first, so I just noticed something about you, that when your voice goes up, there's like, your voice sort of breaks in the upper, like that's when they're like, wow, he's on a roll. And I actually don't want to stop because I love your rants. As you said, sanctimonious. <laughs> was that word, sanctimonious. That was the, he's on. Why you would vote Republican because of the policies. And I said, let's not talk about policies. I understand differences. The point I want to make is the Republican Party has shot its moderates in Congress. I don't know about the states, but at least in Congress, the Republican Party is not capable of doing its constitutional duty of holding Donald Trump to then vote for the other party. But no, for the reasons that you say. Because it's not that the Democratic Party in Congress is doing all these terrible things. Now, fine, AOC, if she had her way, maybe she would do things that you would hate. But the Democratic Party is still a center-left party overall, headed by Joe Biden, who recently said, no, fund the police, fund the police. I'm just saying, the Democratic Party is not the crazy party. But all the things you're talking about are the things that the woke left vote from because, and they would point to exactly the trends you're pointing to. So that's the situation we face, is that the left and the right, have, we have these, this far right, which is not conservative or liberal, they're illiberal. We have a far left, which is not liberal, it's illiberal. Um, we have two parties. We used to have a center left, center right party, now we don't quite have that anymore. So it's a complete mess. We're in a culture war in which, exactly as the founding fathers warned us, Madison said something like, because of the spirit of partisanship, that people are more inclined to vex and oppress each other than to work together for the common welfare. 
And that's the situation that we're in. You agree? Well, yeah, I, I, I do basically agree. I, I don't agree not to talk about policy, although I understand why you want to bracket it, because there's so much noise flying around that uh, we can't see the process things that you want us to focus on, yeah, the structural things exactly. you want us to focus on. I like that you pick up on my passion, which I... Uh, oh, you're uh, the best in the business. I first I, you, I, that, I, Rob, I, that Rob Monts documentary on Brown, that's where I first saw you do a rant. I just, uh, I, just I loved you ever since that. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I can see where that uh, observation of yours would come from, being uh, a person who sees the emotions as the bedrock of the of the moral judgment not the not mm-hmm. the reason faculty i hope not to have abandoned my reasoning faculty in the midst of my emotional expressions but uh that's neither here nor there uh okay so remedies i mean you you said um what did you say you said uh, uh reform social media uh you said uh, harden the institutions and you said uh teach the youth of the next generation in a way that allows them to not be driven as crazy mm-hmm. uh, as the current generation are having been driven. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, let's do so. Let's do let's do the kids briefly, and then let's focus maybe the rest of our time on the institutions, especially the institution of the university, because that's where I think you and I have the most expertise. That's what Heterodox Academy is all about. So briefly on the kid front. Um, so you know, in the cognitive American mind, Greg and I. Um, analyze it in the book, we have like six different threads that all came together to create the explosions around 2014, 2015. And the two big ones, I think, um, for Gen Z are that they were basically, they were denied a normal human childhood and therefore they came out stunted because free play is what kids need. And the other is too early, uh, expo- to getting on social media too early, which is, defines Gen Z. Gen Z is defined as born in 1997 or later. Um, and they are different because the millennials didn't get social media until college. Uh, but Gen Z, if you're born in 1997, you got Facebook or Instagram in middle school. And that, I believe, really affected their, their brain development, their social development. But the, the, the thing that doesn't get talked about as much is the, um, the free play, childhood free play. Um, the, uh, the normal human childhood is the adults are doing things and the kids are around and they're playing with each other. And they're helping out, they're copying, they're pretending to do the adult things. It's play in mixed age groups. This is very important. The kids are playing in mixed age groups, also interacting with adults. And this is how you learn to become an adult. And this is how you learn to have conflicts. You have conflicts, but you work them out. So kids need thousands and thousands of conflicts. They need lots of experience. But what we did in America was um, we said, in, so you, know, you and I grew up during a crime wave. There was a big crime wave in the 70s and 80s. Um, and it started in the 60s. And so there was actually danger of crime, but we still played outside. Kids went outside, second, third grade, you're out with your friends, biking around your town, you can buy candy, whatever, you're out on your own. You learn to function, you learn autonomy, you learn to be a person. And in the 90s, the crime wave ends, but yet we freak out about child abduction. And we say, oh, you can't go outside anymore because you'll be abducted. Uh, you have to stay home and do you know, math preparation to get into college or whatever it is. So um, so kids were deprived of play beginning in the 90s and especially in 2000s. Wait, you're wrinkling your brow. You're not agreeing with me? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm fascinated at the granularity of the account where you're looking okay. at very specific timing and, you know, uh, uh, rather idiosyncratic features of, it, of, of uh, social intercourse, uh, in, in this case, child maturation and their psychological development, to draw big conclusions about that macro. I'm impressed, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just saying, wow. Okay, That's got it. Good okay. Social science. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because because the mystery you're trying to solve is why is it that this world that you and I love, these universities, I don't know what you felt about them, but I, I loved I oh, loved man. being a professor. And it was yeah. amazing until 2012, 2013. And then like out of nowhere, all this weird stuff started happening that made it very difficult for us to do our jobs. And, and so that was my puzzle. Why 2014, 2015? Why did everything blow up then? It wasn't a gradual thing, it was sudden. It was like a light switch turned on. And it was the arrival of Gen Z combined, which was shaped by social media, combined with other innovations in social media. So when you say about solutions, what are we going to do about this? Um, I co-founded an organization with Lenore Skenazy, who wrote Free Range Kids. Uh, It's called Let Grow. And so anyone out there, if you have kids under the age of, let's say, 16, please go to letgrow.org. And uh, we give all kinds of tools and ideas for what you can do to give your kid a more free range childhood 
That's what kids need to develop basic human competences. That's what we blocked kids from getting. So free play is the biggest single thing that kids need. Um, and we've gotten laws passed in four states now to make it legal to play outside. Um, in most of the country, it's ambiguous. If your kid is caught in a park without an adult, what happens? If some busybody says, oh, there are kids in the park, you know, they call 911. Uh, before you know it, uh, they come to the parent's house. They say, you know, child neglect. Why was your kid unsupervised? So that, that's crazy. That was never the case before about uh, the early 2000s. Um, it's only after 2000 that we start hearing stories of parents who are arrested, or at least their kids are they're put into custody because the kids were caught outside. Like, so kids have to be outside unsupervised. Um, so that's a big piece of it. Um, because otherwise they come to college and what happens? Someone tells a joke. They overhear a joke in the cafeteria and they freak out about it and they report it because they don't have experience of being offended without getting the person punished by an adult. So uh, yeah. this isn't going to turn around until we give childhood back to kids. That's the first thing. Okay. Um, all right. And then the, the, the social media piece I've been uh, writing a lot about. Um, I think there is no way to make Instagram and other platforms safe for kids under 16. And by platforms, obviously, you know, Zoom, Roblox, there are all kinds of ways that kids can interact with each other. That's great. I have no objection to that. Multiplayer video games, they're interacting. What I'm concerned about, what it turns out the data shows, is it's when kids, and especially girls, are posting and waiting for comments from others. That's the, that's the kind of platform that's harmful to kids. It's the posting and waiting for strangers or even friends to comment. Why did, why did he like her picture but not my picture? So even though a lot of these girls are spending four or five hours a day on the platform, when they're not on the platform, they're thinking about it. And they're thinking about, you know, I see them in Washington Square Park here, all the posing, the, you know, it's all for Instagram. So much time spent posing, editing, thinking, commenting. So um, it's not healthy for kids going through puberty, especially girls, to be entirely focused on what people are saying about sexy photos of them. That's really warping. There's no way to make that safe. So I think those are some big things that have to change. Um, Let so me interrupt next... this with a, a very, very quick question. Do you see cross-national variation mm -hmm. in the way in which these effects are playing out, such that are there things particular about American social uh, uh, demography, or, uh, social structure, class structure, mm -hmm. whatnot, uh, that are uh, amplifying the deleterious effects of social media that you've outlined. Yes. So here's the pattern, which is a little mysterious, but I think I figured out what might be happening. The pattern is U.S., Canada, and U.K. are identical. No difference. Exact same mental health plots All in all of them. The girls start going, uh, getting depressed and anxious in 2012, 2013. The boys follow soon after. Um, in all of them, it's the exact same patterns. Uh, if people go to my webpage, jonathanheight.com slash social media, I've got links to the main Google Docs where I collect the evidence. You can see the graphs. You can see the summaries. So U.S., U.K., Canada are identical. No difference. And the crazy stuff that happened on campus, the canceling of speakers, the freaking out. You know, in Canada, uh, you know, yoga was said to be cultural appropriation. It had to be shut down. All that stuff happens in the, in the Anglosphere at the same time. Um, I visited Australia and New Zealand. Same thing only two or three years later. They were delayed and not quite as intense. So the Anglosphere is identical. The Germanic world is not like us. So you don't see these problems in Switzerland, Austria, Germany, Denmark, Norway, Sweden. All the Scandinavian countries are not like us because I think it's because they still, they have not changed the way they raise kids. In those countries, they have forest schools. So the kids will have school outside. They learn to make fires when they're six years old, as human kids have been doing for tens of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. So the Germanic kid, the Germanic cultures still give their kids childhood. And I think that means that even though their kids, of course, are on screens a lot, they, they develop normal brains, normal social skills. So I don't think social media has, dam has caused as much damage in those countries. Um, but in the Anglosphere, it has. And this is very interesting, something I'm just beginning to appreciate. Um, the online world has no national borders, but it does have linguistic borders. So I need to study, I'm just learning about Tumblr, whether Tumblr affected girls in all the English-speaking countries, but not the French or German countries. I don't know if that's true, but I, that's my hypothesis that I'm going to try to try to study. Okay, three quick questions. Closing down the schools during COVID, is that a manifestation? Transgender uh, explosion, is that a manifestation? And race. Yep. Wasn't that a part of what happened in 2014, 15, and so forth? Yeah. 
Yes. So, uh, um, so uh, yes, it seems like, like everything is blowing up, and those are exactly the hot button issues uh, that I'm very hesitant to speak on because uh, it's just it's all downside for me. Uh, but what I can say is, um, let's let's just take okay. I've never really talked about trans, but let's just take that as an example because uh, I'm going to focus again on the structural things. Mm-hmm. So you know, as we know, you know, trans. Uh, you know, there have been trans people for a, a long, long time. It certainly is a, is a real thing. Um, uh, and suddenly, around I think it was in 2017, we have a giant increase in the number of girls who are now saying that they're trans. Now, it you know, it could well be that they're right, or it could well be that. It's, it's a fad. It's a thing. Uh, my daughter went to a summer camp, a regular summer camp, and most of the girls in her bunk, these are 11 and 12-year-old girls. They've had no sexual experience. Most of them say they're trans, gay, non-binary. They don't even know yet, I, I think. But it's, you know, there's a lot of social pressure to be that way. All right. Actually, I don't want to opine on the facts of it. What I want to I opine on is, okay, we have a big change. It could be that the right thing to do is to be supportive and to give them gender-affirming care and hormones. Maybe that's the right thing. Maybe it's not. Wouldn't it be great if we could actually talk about it? That would be a great thing because it's an empirical question. But we can't talk about it uh, because anybody who says, like, no, anybody who says this is not real will be utterly destroyed. Now, I mean, there are people who say it, but they're not in universities. No one in university, no researcher can say uh, and I shouldn't say no, because, I mean, there are some who've, who've said, but boy, do they get, I mean, they get protested. There's, they face a lot of problems. So I'm going to insist on the sort of, the, like, John Stuart Mill, Heterodox Academy. We need viewpoint diversity. We need the freedom to dissent. We need to come at each other, not with insults, but with evidence and arguments. And that's how we figure things out. Um, and because we can't do that anymore since 2014, 2015, that means I think a group that is structurally stupid will usually get the wrong answer, usually could be wrong. So whatever we're doing on trans, it's probably mostly wrong. And I can say that without knowing any facts about details because our discussion is structurally stupid because there's no dissent. Now on race, it's more complicated, but I'll just point out, and this might be where you're going, um, on race, these are incredibly complicated issues that have been at the center of the social sciences, at least since the 60s. And these are complicated issues. And let's say on, you know, policing policy, we all would like to improve policing policy, as Moose Algarbi and others have argued, and in Roland Fryer and many others, the police are killing too many people. It's not clear that there's a bias towards killing black people, but that's an empirical question. We should be able to discuss it. Um, but we should be able to, uh, with, if we can't discuss it, if we shoot dissidents, then we're usually going to be wrong. And this is what I meant when I mentioned Pyrrhic victories. I think the left, ha- the cultural left has won Pyrrhic victory after Pyrrhic victory on race. And if you get the district attorney in San Francisco or Philadelphia to stop prosecuting shoplifting because that causes systemic race, you know, systemically different outcomes, well, that might be a Pyrrhic victory. But guess what? When crime state, so if we had good policy discussions, we could actually get the right answer. But since we've become structurally stupid in our universities, in, in, in all kinds of political organizations, we usually get the wrong answer. And then it backfires in the long run. What do you think? Okay, excuse me, very briefly, very, very briefly. Um, we know the right answer. Oh, we do? What's the right answer? Well, and, and it's a political strike, you know. <laughs> On the transgender thing, we know that uh, uh, an epidemic of opinion and uh, sensibility amongst teenage girls that leads to the widespread adoption of this particular personality expression is bad for the future of our culture. We know that, uh, in effect, suspending the laws that uh, against shoplifting and other such uh, actions of disorder on behalf of a issue of racial justice is to, in effect, surrender the the the, the citadel. It's to give up on the very sinew that holds us together. We know that. Uh, the uh, creeping relativization of evaluation, of grading, of testing, of yeah. assessment of intellectual expression, justified by an argument about equity, an, an argument that takes ipso facto the disparity of performance mm-hmm. between identifiable groups as a systemic failure. Uh, in, indicting the system for racism, we know that's wrong. And the example that uh, allowed me, that motivated me to confront you when you came to Brown University, mm-hmm. we know the seven in 10 babies born to a woman without a husband amongst African-Americans is an absolute catastrophe. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're not going to have good outcomes speaking. if you've got that. Yeah. Okay. Now, I mean, I'm saying all those things. I mean, we know that if Charles Murray says IQ is one thing or another, as you would put it, he may be right or he may be wrong. But the issue is, what's the evidence showing? Mm -hmm. And not whether or not it's the Southern Poverty yeah. Law Center would have it. Yeah. <laughs> Charles Murray is a white supremacist yeah. for writing a book about IQ. Yeah, I mean, right. I, you know, we, we know these things and, and we know a lot of other things beside and we're not alone in knowing them. We know that the performance of the Asians when they compete to get into these places like Harvard is, historically speaking, not dissimilar from the performance of the Jews a century ago when they were beginning to compete to get into these things. And we know that the future of the country depends for its continued vitality upon nurturing and fostering this kind of human excellence, which we're fortunate among peoples on the planet to have the benefit from because we're an open society to which people have been flocking for centuries. We know these things. The, yes. So I'm just going to, I'm looking for my, where's my John Stuart Mill book? At Heterox Academy, we put, out, <laughs> we put out an edition. Here it is. We put out an edition of All Minus One. And, um, and so I'm going to agree with every single thing you said that we know. I'm going to agree with it in the sense that I think it's probably or very likely to be right, in the sense that there's a lot of evidence supporting it. If I had to bet money, I would bet on, I think, each of the propositions you said. But John Stuart Mill on Liberty, Chapter 2, one of the greatest philosophical works ever, one of the foundations of liberalism, one of the foundations of universities, um, uh, he, makes, he makes three arguments about why we must have viewpoint diversity and freedom of speech and inquiry. And his first argument is the opinion may possibly be true. That is, the critics of your opinions, even though it seems like they're wrong, on if you look at all the things you said, I'll bet you're not entirely right on all of them. We don't know which ones. And so you have to allow the critics. And so here's one where I don't know what the answer is, but it's complicated. So my kids go to New York City public schools. My son got into Brooklyn Tech. That, that's where he is. It's a you know, very selective school. Um, and they just use the, the one admission test. That's all they use. And then, of course, the you know, force on the left they want to get rid of the test. They want to do all sorts of engineering to get racial equity. Um, and I'm with you that if you use different standards for different races, if you lower, and this is going to have bad outcomes. But we certainly don't know that the test is the best way to go. Because what the test rewards is IQ to some extent, but to a very large extent, it's how much are your parents willing to sacrifice your childhood to make you study every day after school? And the, the Chinese kids from these poor families, God bless them, they come here, they work hard, but what are they working at? They're working at the tests. And they get, they get into the top schools, and then they get into the top universities. Now, that is certainly open to at least question. So I'm just going to say, I agree with all the things that you said, but yet... If you don't listen to the critics, you're going to miss that. You're going to just defend the test. We have to have the test. And I think that's actually wrong. Okay. And I don't know what the right answer is. Because what we, but, you know, so we, we don't have a good admission well, system. Well, in let, let me observe that the reason I gave the examples that I gave is because those expressions of opinion that I just got giving voice to are the ones you can't say in the university without getting cashiered. That's right. You know, that's so it's not as if I'm not allowing other arguments yeah. Oh, yeah. to be made. Yeah, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Um, yeah, that's true. That's true. And I, you know, I've got to say, I mean, I've spoken a lot of center right, center left. I, you know, I remember the first time I, I was invited to speak at AEI, American Enterprise Institute. Um, uh, Arthur Brooks was a visiting fellow there, I think, in 2007 after the happiness hypothesis. And I was very uh -huh. much on the left. I'd never, never been in any sort of conservative thing. And I was kind of wary, like, what's it going to be like? And, yeah. you know, are they going to be mean or something? Um, but I have to say, uh, when I, you know, when I go to speak in any sort of conservative setting, there's never like a consensus opinion that is enforced. I've never, you know, no one gets angry. Um, you know, there's always some diversity. There's always some people who are a little on the left. And, you know, there's, whereas on, you know, on the left, it is much more orthodox, much more uniform and, and, and people get angry more often. Um, so yeah, you're right. You just said a bunch of things that are the, you know, minority or unorthodox opinion, the banished opinion. Um, in the kinds of places that you and I live, yeah. Why do you think economics amongst the social sciences and uh, humanities is uniquely uh, diverse in terms of uh, the heterodox yeah. political opinion? So, well, it's first. So, first of all, let's distinguish between progressives, social conservatives, and libertarians. Those are three very different psychological types. Yes, and I reviewed the evidence over this early on in Heterox Academy. I was trying to figure out, like, why are conservatives underrepresented? 
um, in, uh, in universities. And what I learned from published papers, and I've got them on one of my web pages somewhere, is if you just look at social conservatives versus social liberals, the social liberals are more intellectual, a little, high, a little higher IQ. So social conservatives are underrepresented. But if you look at what are called economic conservatives or libertarians, they're actually the smartest. They actually have the highest IQ. They solve the logic problems the best. So uh, in economics, you have a lot of um, uh, libertarians and control. So we call them conservatives. But I don't think you have a lot of Christians. Do you have a lot of like, uh, like explicit Christians in economics? I don't know that you have any more than you would find in any other of the disciplines. So I'm, yeah, I'm certainly not a noticeably prominently yeah. expressive. I mean, there, of course, are Christian economists. Right. But it's not, it's, you know, look, much of the country, you know, a very large portion of the country, and this is something I've only seen in conservative circles. I've never heard God mentioned ever uh, in an academic setting, except if other than like, you know, as like a, you know, contemptuous thing or whatever, but, but like actual people believing in God is only when I'm in like, uh, you know, conservative academic circles. Sometimes you'll, you'll hear it a little bit. All I'm trying to say is economics, um, because you have, um, you have a lot of people who are not progressive, but they're not social conservatives. They're actually more libertarian or systems thinkers. So that's the diversity that you have, I think. In you know, it is uh, worth uh, opining here, I mean, uh, observing here just for a moment. Economics is very Jewish. And mm -hmm. I think you, if yeah. you're going to do a discipline-specific study of this kind, you want to take that on board. It's not predominantly Jewish, but it's very Jewish. I yeah. mean, you know, I don't know a number. Oh, yeah. I, I don't no, want to guess a number. But if the number were yeah. 40 or 50 percent, I would not be surprised. Yeah. Um, and uh, there, there's, and I don't know how many people are observant and how many people are, are, you know, are not. Um, but what about religion? Is, is that a, uh, you know, feature of the, of the, uh, stupidity mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> problem? Yeah. Well, so depending on how you, uh, how we think of that, I would say, I would definitely say yes. So there's a, there's a line that I, I come back to a lot from Pascal, um, a paraphrase, he didn't say it exactly like this, but the gist of it was, there's a God-shaped hole in every human heart. That's yeah. a paraphrase of what he said in French. Yeah. And, I, you know, I'm, I study religion in part. My, my second book was called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And my argument is we evolved to be religious. We evolved to worship things in common. We circle around the sacred object that binds us together. If you go to Burning Man, you circle around the Burning Man. I mean, there's all these proto-crypto-religious things we do. It's part of our nature. So we've all got this God-shaped hole in our heart. Um, and people who are religious fill it with God. And they have a set of practices and norms that have evolved over centuries. And they tend to be pretty pro-social. And they're generally, they're learning, their teachings are about, it's not all about you. Don't be so selfish. Service to others. Uh, learn to control your desires. So these are time-tested sets of morals that fit in, and I think in the American context, they make people better people. That's the, uh, the Robert Putnam, um, uh, what's his name, Campbell, the uh, American Grace finding. So if you, if you see people as being religious in that way, and then you take out formal religion, you still have the hole in the heart. So now you've got people, what are you going to put there? And unfortunately, what happens, I think, when you take out religion is it tends to get filled with garbage. That is, it tends to get filled with, it used to be television and advertising and consumer products. Uh, now it's social media and the desire seems to be to be an influencer. So many young people, their top priority is to be an influencer. So I think that we are religious, maybe there's a roundabout way of answering your question, but I think we are a deeply religious species. We evolved that way. We can't get rid of it. But as God has retreated, as formal religion has retreated, as the, by far the fastest growing identification is spiritual, but not religious among Gen Z, that, I don't know if it's a majority yet, but that's hugely grown. I'm spiritual, but not religious. That means many of these young people are very, very prone to taking on their politics as a religion. And that's what we've been, and of course, John McWhorter, of course, has been brilliant on this from 2017. I think he wrote his first article about our, the, our new religion of anti-racism. That anti-racism is functioning like Protestant Christianity, except without any of the good parts. Do you know the book by James Marone, my a colleague here at Political Science called Hellfire Nation. No, I've heard the uh, title. It's a cool title. Yeah, what is yeah. the, what it's it's a, a, a popular history, a, a kind of rough history. He's not a historian, but he does, you know, of, of moral panics in American uh, political history, uh, mm -hmm. anti-alcohol uh, mm -hmm. panics, for example, or 
more recently the concern about uh, child molestation that mm. became a real kind of mania. Yep. Uh, and, and we could add to that list, I assume, if you were to talk about some of the COVID related stuff as being a moral panic or if you talk Absolutely. about some of the reaction to anti-racism concerns, et yep. cetera. But here's what I'm getting at. Um, a movement animated by fervent religious belief mm -hmm. that sweeps through a community or maybe even through a nation that converts people in massive numbers and calls them to return to a certain kind of traditional or a certain kind of conventional uh, religiosity. Uh, and, and that uh, becomes a basis for uh, a, a confronting in a deep way some of the ills that beset society. Mm -hmm. Is that a pipe dream? It, 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 so, for example, well, let me be very clear. what's happening. I, I, well, what mean? I mentioned the uh, issue of out of wedlock births amongst African Americans oh, oh, and stuff like that. Could yeah. there be a movement mm. of, you know, social reform oh. that called people as the Black Power movement did on the identity yeah. questions? African Americans don't die, don't uh, d uh, make your hair straight. Don't uh, yeah. deny your uh, African heritage or whatever. Uh, so, so. Religious revival, uh, Billy Graham-like moral yeah. crusade, uh, is that passe? Pass because isn't that what Black Lives Matter is, in a way? Not quite, not quite. So what? So we, it's different on the right and the left, I believe. So yes, we have religious fervor on both sides. But what you're describing is a kind of a traditional conservative religious fervor, like the Great Awakenings, the Christian yes. Great Awakenings. That is Those what I'm called people back to a, a more, uh, you know, a, a more powerful kind of religion. And it tends to be, oh gosh, what was, uh, oh, there's a wonderful chapter in John Tierney and uh, Roy Baumeister's book, The Power of Bad, on how you have these reformed Christianities that are really nice, but people actually kind of crave the harder, harsher stuff. And, and, and so what you're describing does happen, but it's more in what we would think of as the right. On the left, the proper term I think is Jacobin. It's not a, it's not a call to return to the way things were. It's a call, to, a call to bring about equality by violent means if necessary. And the Jacobin movements tend not to focus on pulling up the bottom. That's very hard to do. We've been trying that for a long time. Jacobin movements almost always, yep, you pull down the top. You literally kill the people on top. Now, in America, unfortunately, it's not killing, but it, well, it's social yeah. killing. You want to kill them socially. So um, when Greg and I were writing The Coddling, I, I read a lot of the sociology of witch, uh, witch hunts, McCarthyism, the Cultural Revolution in China. And in all those, you know, the Cultural Revolution, it's it started by college students. They, they humiliate their profession. Unfortunately, the revolutionary power on the left is not a call to return to what was time-tested. It's a call to tear down the top, tear down everything, build a new utopia. And that, I think, has a track record of absolute zero success. Okay. You think McWhorter's on something with his uh, invocation of the religious uh, metaphor? Oh, in perfect. It's exactly, yeah. I mean, speaking as somebody, again, my, my whole work is on how we evolved to be tribal, small group religious people worshiping trees and gods and elves and things and circle. I mean, that's our evolution. And I think John is really, you know, he, again, he was really one of the first to point about how this new, this new political movement on campus and elsewhere, it really was a lot like Protestant Christianity. Yeah. Okay, well. John, thanks for your time. Wonderful talking to you. We said we're going to keep it to an hour, and I think uh, we're not quite there, but it's an appropriate point uh, to uh, call a halt to this edition of the Glenn Lowry, uh, Jonathan Haidt conversation, which I hope will continue in the near future. Thank you, Glenn. I, I hope it will. I, I you know, I, you know, we had limited time, so I didn't let you. I was actually hoping that I'd get you on a really nice long rant, <coughs> uh, but uh, we'll have to save that for. Uh, for another time. But thanks okay. for being an early member of Heterodox Academy. 